Okay, so welcome to the first offering of the infectious disease uh, public health related um, bioinformatics workshop. Uh, I'm a, as I mentioned, a senior scientist at the Center for Disease Control. And the type of work that I do there essentially is to try to set up uh, genomic epidemiology as a routine wor uh, workflow at uh, BCCDC. Um, and my research interests include um, the sequence analysis component of uh, genomic epidemiology, but I'm also uh, interested in how you can integrate uh, diverse data sets uh, through the use of ontology. So these are the two areas that I will uh, cover a little bit in, in this module. The introductory module is also meant to um, sort of fill in holes of uh, some background knowledge that you may not have uh, in order to sort of make the subsequent sections uh, uh, more understandable. But a, a lot of you, I looked at your application, have extensive experiences already. So I also want to make this sort of a, a interactive session. So you have comments to add, feel free to, uh, to just pipe up. And if it's important enough, I'll, I'll repeat it so it's recorded. Uh, but if I don't, that's just because I forget. So please do remind me uh, to repeat your comments for the for the recording. Um, so a brief overview for the course. Uh, we will uh, start with the introduction, the background, talk a little bit about why you're here, what's the benefit of genomic ep epidemiology. Uh, we'll also uh, uh, give you some idea what the um, it challenges facing uh, genomic epidemiology is. Uh, in module two, then we'll start to go into the technical aspect of how you can actually uh, carry out genomic ep epidemiological type of analysis in your own group. So we'll have both the background session, but also a hands-on session on how you can construct biogenetic trees, how you can um, um, perform single nucleotide variant or single nucleotide polymorphism analysis. And modules three will cover uh, molecular subtyping uh, activities using whole genome sequencing. And uh, that would uh, take us to the end of today. And in, uh, tonight we'll have the keynote by Fiona Brinkman on open bioinformatics. Um, in module four tomorrow morning, uh, Andrew will talk about antimicrobial resistant genes and how uh, whole genome sequencing has transformed some of the uh, laboratory practice in terms of AMR detection and AMR characterization. i uh, show you some of the bioinformatic tools to do so. Uh, module five um, will be <coughs> done by Rob on phylogeography. So you, um, you know, you, epidemiology is about people, place, and time, and how do we uh, link genomic data to location information and how do we interpret that and how do we visualize that uh, will be covered in module five. Uh, module six will be covered by Gary who um, will talk to you about metagenomics and how that can be used to detect uh, emerging pathogens. Um, and module seven done by Anna on uh, data visualization, uh, more of a high level uh, uh, conceptual introduction to how visualization can be used to improve your understanding of uh, analysis. So the general learning objective for the whole workshop is to understand how genomic epidemiology can improve public health microbiology, uh, how you can process genomic sequence data using a variety of bioinformatic tools I will show you, and all the tools I will showing you are open source tools that you can download and, and use um, at your own institute. And of course, uh, as um, Anne and mentioned, that uh, you can also use them on Amazon Cloud if you decide to buy time there and so on. We'll also show you how you can interpret genomic data in epidemiological context and perform several types of epidemiological analysis throughout this workshop. Um, uh, then in uh, module seven, we'll have, help you understand the fundamentals of uh, data visualization, uh, which is an area that's in active research and uh, tools have just been built now, but, uh, and, um, and I will show you 
uh, how you can actually use R and Shiny <coughs> to build some simple visualization tools. Um, lastly, uh, hopefully in this workshop, you'll recognize some of the limitations and challenges of genomic epidemiology, which is a rapidly evolving field, as we know. For this uh, module one, uh, the learning objectives are to be familiar with the role of public health agencies, uh, to be f uh, familiar with next generation sequencing and subvocation in public health microbiology. Uh, I think most of you have some exposure to NGS already, but it will just be a conceptual overview. And be familiar with sequence data processing. Again, it's just a conceptual overview of that how what kind of data massaging, what data <coughs> processing that need to be done uh, for subsequent analysis. So you have a sense when you actually do these in the uh, tutorials and in the in your assignments, uh, we give you a conceptual background. Uh, then you hopefully will also be f able to recognize the importance of metadata in sequence analysis and data integration. Uh, genomic as a Field is actually, uh, microbial genomics, I should say, is the field is fairly mature. It, the first genome came out in '95, and uh, hundreds of thousands of genomes have been sequenced uh, to date. But the issue with most of the data is that they come with very little contextual information, and therefore it makes the interpretation of the, the sequence quite difficult. So Hopefully, after this uh, workshop, you'll get a, a sense why contextual information, especially the organization and the harmonization of contextual information, is important for uh, for uh, interpretation of genomics data. Uh, last, lastly, I'll have a quick few slides, uh, depending on the time, to cover the different genomic epidemiology analysis in this course. I sort of gave you the uh, I already gave you a rundown in my previous slide, but we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit more. So briefly, the, the role of a public health agency is to track and intervene the spread of diseases to improve health of the population. Uh, and through this process, hopefully we learn some lessons and be able to come up with policies and strategies to prevent disease from occurring in the first place. Public health laboratory tests patients and environmental samples and detect um, the pathogens and determine the, the cause of diseases. Uh, at the provincial lab, uh, which is, I guess, a mid-sized uh, by, um, by the uh, mid to large size by the country standard, <laughs> we process about 3,000 3, samples a day and about a million samples a year. And the, there are uh, commonly uh, described as two, two dual arms of uh, public health agency. Uh, first is the epidemiological uh, investigation interested in people, place, and time. For example, in a uh, foodborne outbreak investigation, epidemiologists or uh, um, environmental microbiologists might form my, my uh, phones the patient up and ask what type of food was consumed, where was the food consumed, and when was the food consumed. And uh, using epidemiological information, um, they try to infer a common exposure. And if enough cases point to a common exposure, this is uh, called uh, confirmed by epidemiology. The laboratory arm, on the other hand, uh, are interested in testing the actual samples that, uh, that are uh, derived from the environment or from the patient, and asking what kind of pathogens might be found in the samples, what uh, subtype of pathogens for uh, epidemiological tracing and so on, what subtype of pathogens. And you'll learn a bit more, a lot about, about this uh, in the next few uh, se uh, sessions. And uh, the goal is to identify the, the pathogen and to type the pathogen. And if, if um, again, enough cases point to a common uh, pathogen, then this is uh, considered an uh, outbreak that's confirmed by laboratory analysis. So uh, why do we want, why do we interest in applying genomics to uh, outbreak analysis? This is a, a picture of all the 
uh, air, airplane uh, fly paths that are around the world. And uh, as you can see, uh, we are at the age where uh, there's a lot of uh, traffic around the world. And with the traffic and the, the trade, it brings the, um, the pathogen with it as well. But if you just take an epidemiological approach, how do you try to narrow down the common exposure when there are so many uh, ba uh, background noise? So one study that's done that I found quite interesting is this metagenomic analysis of toilet waste from long distance flights, and a step toward global surveillance of infectious disease and antimicrobial resistance. So this is a study done out of Denmark that uh, took waste uh, samples from from uh, 18 different flights from three con three different continents. Uh, uh, I, I don't think, I, I don't know, I don't think so, but I guess it's considered waste, so it's like go out and collecting waste in it somewhere. So um, the, uh, the three continents are North America, Europe, and, and, and Asia, and the uh, what I found kind of interesting is that 400 liters of waste is produced per flight. That's how much, uh, I guess, including the blue waters that, that, that they use to flush the, the toilet. But anyway, so they, for uh, sake of not contaminating the samples, basically shipped the full 400 liter of, of uh, waste to their lab. And I'm sure they didn't process the whole thing. They, 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 they extracted a sub subsample and then sequence the, the DNA that they found in the, the human excrement. Um, so the samples are clustered based on a microbiome profile. Um, and if you're interested in more how to do that, there's the uh, microbiome workshop that CBW offers. A uh, bit of a shameless uh, plug there. But it's, already full it's already full this year, but yeah. But next year, you can certainly take it. And the... Um, they also characterized in, uh, the antimicrobial resistant genes found in the, in the samples, and this is something that you will learn more in uh, Andrew's uh, lecture. So long story short, uh, they, were, they found that the samples indeed do cluster by geographic origins, uh, suggesting that it could be a way actually to identify the source of, of contamination with flights based on characterization of microbiome. Uh, and what's, all, what's sort of more biologically interesting is that the, there's a higher proportion of antibiotic resistant genes found in flights from uh, South Asia compared, which are labeled in, in red compared to North America or uh, other parts of Asia. Oh, I thought it was Europe, but it's actually just another part of Asia that they looked at. Okay, the study references course is at the bottom in case you're interested. So the current state of clinical microbiology lab it, uh, involves a variety of, of different tests uh, which um, increase the, the needs for uh, triaging of samples and need different platforms, different reagents, so on and so forth to process these samples. And the a well-run lab uh, has a stringent QC and, and um, SOP in place to make sure all the tests run smoothly. For example, at BCCC, there's over 100 um, test, I, test, tests that we perform regularly that's available to order on our test menu. And that makes the makes running a lab more challenging <laughs> because you have to organize the test based on the amount of time needed, based on the amount, the, the type of reagent needs, so on and so forth. Um, and also some of the slowing, slow growing organisms, uh, if you have to culture them and you have to run susceptibility, so anti, uh, antimicrobial profiling um, resistant profiling on these uh, pathogens, it also takes a long time. Um, the turnaround time, as a result of that, the turnaround time uh, for tests could be somewhere between, between minutes or sometimes it 
take months to complete. And often specialized tests that we cannot perform locally have to be sent to the National Microbiology Lab. And the transit time and the um, and, uh, the transit time also adds significantly to the, the testing uh, delay. What's proposed is that whole genome sequencing was or DNA-based technology, sequencing-based technology can take replace some of the, the existing uh, tests and therefore simplify the workflow uh, significantly in the laboratory setting. And also, uh, since the sequencing time and the data processing time can be uh, quite well uh, characterized and, and um, optimized, the overall uh, turnaround time is also easier to control, and as sequencers becomes desktop sequencers becomes commoditized uh, in uh, local or frontline labs, these type of workflow it it's becomes a, even easier to um, to become a distributed uh, network. And so genomic epidemiology, the name itself really is, is, doesn't have a lot of creativity built into it. It's really just a combination of whole genome sequencing, genomics, data uh, from pathogens with epidemiological investigations to track the spread of infectious diseases. What's important uh, to realize is that they go hand in hand. So the epidemiology um, support the contextual information for performing genomic sequence analysis, and the genomic sequence information in turn provides high-resolution data for uh, typing data or high-resolution um, test results for, uh, for epidemiological investigation to, to help um, filtering out the background cases from uh, linked cases. So knowing all the, um, knowing some of the uh, workflows and how genomic epidemiology can help streamline lab analysis, the question to ask is why are you here or why, what's the benefits of whole genome sequencing? And um, there are a few front runners in the world that have already made whole genome sequencing as their uh, routine an analysis pipeline. This include the UK's Public House England um, lab network that are committed to sequence all salmonella isolates submitted. And the US FDA and CDC also has a distributed network system uh, of uh, um, state labs that help to sequence the data, but then the analysis, I guess that's why some of you are here, uh, presents a challenge when uh, in such a distribution distributed uh, network. Uh, so one reason that you're here might be because whole genome sequencing is, is forced upon you, so you're forced to, to learn about it. But there are other benefits beyond, you know, beyond that. So as I mentioned already, it simplifies the workflow, uh, improves the turnaround time in, in some of the applications. Uh, it reduces the cost by reducing the number of platforms and reagents that you have to maintain. And also, uh, sequencing is becoming commoditized, making it easier to deploy uh, to uh, regional labs. And also, uh, very important, especially when it comes to data analysis, <coughs> that the, the sequence results can be more easily um, shared with, with other uh, groups and. Uh, and it's the, by and large, it's more comparable um, than, say, for example, a gel picture or, say, some type of um, PCR assay where you might not use the same primers or for whatever reason the tests are less comparable. Whereas the whole genome sequence data, uh, partly due to the limited number of sequencing platforms available and also partly due to the nature of uh, uh, genomic sequences itself, means that the data is it's, uh, easier to compare across, across uh, different institutions. 
uh, however, there are some challenges associated with the with whole, uh, genomic epidemiology. The results, for example, uh, could be harder to interpret because uh, now you're uh, giving a larger number, uh, a large data set that you have to analyze and, and, and you have to learn how to process it. The computational resource requirement is also higher and typically there's not a lot of local IT support. Uh, and there's, it's also a rapidly changing technology, um, meaning that um, as we tweak the pipelines or the parameters, it could affect the results and how do you balance uh, the use of technology and, and the evolve, evolution with the improvement of the technology is it, a, a challenge that all bioinformaticians working in this area is, uh, are facing. The per sample cost is still relatively high um, and often batching of samples uh, is required to achieve cost saving uh, efficiently and some labs may simply not have the throughput to batch enough samples to, to achieve that uh, uh, cost efficiency. So uh, there are other benefits and challenges, so I want to sort of hear from the, the crowd if you guys have any other to add to the, to the list based on your own experience. There was a paper published recently about uh, cross-run contamination on the high seed machines. Yeah. Yeah, so... Right. So when you batch samples, uh, the cross contamination from one sample to another could happen, and there uh, instrumentation uh, instrument limitations associated with how well the signal can be interpreted, and, and some of the contamination <laughs> happens on the instrument rather than due to human uh, or the operator error. So, so that's, that's definitely an issue when when you need to batch. Any other? Um, I think right Challenges now, like the states, we're using PFGE and uh, whole genome sequencing also a lot more resolution to being uh, able to identify clusters. Okay, so that's a that's a benefit. Yeah, big benefit. Yeah. So higher resolution compared to existing tests such as PFG. Anyone else? Right, so it, uh, one is the issue, challenges associated with um, uh, storage of the data, especially when it comes to privacy and when it comes to transferring of large data sets, and also uh, challenges associated with uh, um, the, uh, what was it, the uh, uh, incidental fin findings. Uh, that, yeah, so uh, uh, so incidental finding means that you are looking for one bug, but you might, as an example, you were looking for one bug, you might find something else. For example, you might actually find out that the patient has HIV when you're doing a metagenomic sequencing. So what do you do in that situation? Do you tell the patient or, or because the person come in for other uh, diseases, you just report that disease? So that there's ethical issues that need to be resolved. Right, and there's also the incidental finding of, of the host's own DNA uh, that might, might might be found in the host's own DNA. Anything else? Are you? Just wanted to mention that to pick a lot of public health labs um, and the networks of public health labs rely on the um, exchange of cultured ice nuts and the bio baking of those cultured ice nuts so that we can pull the bio and look at them later and do the like, retro practice that. Value is culture collections, but the evolution of whole genome sequencing, especially, is, is it promising possibly in the near future the ability to do something called culture independent diagnostic testing, where you just grab a specimen, a biological specimen, a sputum or a fecal sample, and you analyze it directly 
using cultural tools and methods, and you no longer need to culture and store that specimen, which has um, uh, implications, serious implications for uh, how public health labs can um, well, be able to operate in the future. Because essentially, there's a lot of worry that we're losing a valuable resource in that culture. But the, uh, you know, the times of the essence, whenever there's a, some type of an outbreak, there's some type of an uh, uh, investigation going on, it's a unique, just a need for more culture to isolate the analysis versus the two or three hours of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So just briefly sum, summing it for the recording, the issue associated with essentially it's a digital photo phenomenon that we're facing now as we transition to just having the sequence data and not the original biological samples uh, or, the, or the isolates <coughs> that are kept, uh, we are potentially losing um, in, uh, in, uh, important uh, resource that currently are performed as part of uh, routine laboratory work. So, for example, at BCCC, we have a huge cultural collection based on the isolates that we uh, obtain throughout the years. And um, and if we just go straight to metagenomic sequencing or if we perform whole genome sequencing and not keep the samples in uh, Later on, we will not be able to to retrieve those uh, those uh, samples. So, Bill here, do you have a sense of how what percentage of these are not sold? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. 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 If I were to be a culture teacher, I would say that there were, we can actually do, uh, using direct some specific approaches, we can, um, we can take um, data from a uh, well, from microbes that, uh, that you can't isolate, yeah. right? And the ratio that has been, um, uh, you know, suggested is that what one to one. So about one percent are culture, about 99% are not then you go on and look at other researchers like Mike Surratt, who will has you know, proven that you can uh, isolate only one percent of the samples and say I'm just going to fail like a lot of you know what you have. Yeah. If you work hard on, on, on yeah, on one on, 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 on culture. In fact, I think he's, well, he has uh, demonstrated that you can isolate 600% uh, <laughs> because there are very small Populations in the microbiome that are not accessible by sequencing, but you can culture them. And so I think it's also demonstrated that the knowledge of the microbiome is Here you have to speak up. Sure. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but the other the other consideration is um, what percentage of the samples are submitted to the lab have unknown etiology, so you are unable to find a known pathogen associated with that. And I think as we do more metagenomic sequencing of those samples, we'll find out more about potential pathogens that might cause diseases. But uh, the I think it, you have to break down the problem a bit. The known pathogens, the, the successful success rate for culturing is actually quite high in the in the lab, but there's uh, the unknowns that that are much harder to estimate. Anyone else want to add anything before I move on?
Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so Andrew brought up a good point that uh, going from genotype to phenotype is not always uh, straightforward or easy. Um, but there's an up, so, so in order to improve that, the bioinformatic process or the analysis for that, the phenotypical test and the genotypical test need to be performed hand in hand for the next little while to, to help us build up the, the knowledge uh, to translate from genotype to phenotype. And the other issue uh, with direct sequencing is we don't know if the organism is viable or not. So you found the DNA, but is the organism still viable? So I have a study, for example, looking at environmental samples for avian influenza viruses. So we are able to, to, ident to find and to type these um, RNAs from, from soil sediment samples. But how long have those viruses been there and are they still viable? That's a bit of unknown. And actually, in collaboration with CFIA, we are trying to culture these uh, viruses right, to see if they are still uh, viable or not. Okay, so here's the section where I go into a bit of the background knowledge gap filling exercise. So feel free to pipe up if you want to add anything or if anything doesn't make sense. Uh, so in this course, we're by and large giving you bacterial genomic samples to deal with. And so I'm going to focus on, on that. Uh, so typically, they contain uh, within the single circular chromosome. Uh, and some of the bacterial genomes are, are linear. Uh, and also very important is that they're typically a haploid genome, meaning that there's only one allele per gene uh, in a, in a um, or in an organism, in a cell, and, and they reproduce uh, asexually, so-called. However, um, they may contain plasmids that are uh, extra chromosomal DNAs that are potentially much more uh, in, uh, um, transferable across organisms. So the genome of bacterial, uh, bacteria is the gene content harbored by the chromosome and its plasmid. Uh, and Certainly, when it comes to antimicrobial resistance and other uh, and virulence factors and so on, a uh, disproportionate amount of those important genes are found on the plasma rather than the genome. Uh, genome sizes are not particularly big when it comes to bacterial genomes. They're typically 0.5 meg to about 10 uh, megabase. And the average, is, uh, especially for pathogens, is somewhere between 2, 3, uh, to five megabases and roughly correspond to, uh, uh, it's roughly one meg per thousand uh, genes. So these organisms typically contains uh, two, uh, 200 to 500 genes. However, the genomes are uh, constantly evolving, constantly under uh, uh, selection pressure and uh, there are some key ones uh, highlighted here. Uh, some of the human pathogens are known to have undergone a genome reduction um, and become specialized, so-called lean and mean. Uh, they lost certain metabolic pathways that they no longer need, but they, uh, in exchanges, that they adopt very well in a certain uh, niche. Um, on, uh, and the other driving force is uh, genome rearrangement, which can affect the gene expression, which can be turned on and off fairly rapidly uh, in certain pathogens, such as Neisseria. Uh, gene duplications uh, allows the organism to evolve new functions by uh, first duplicating a gene, and then one copy of the genes uh, would be under less of a selective pressure and therefore allow to mutate faster and potentially change. And this is uh, um, uh, correspond to also to the, to the gene uh, loss in genome reduction. And two, uh, uh, the, the last one that I want to mention is uh, uh, horizontal or lateral gene transfer, and this is the acquisition of genetic material <laughs> from a non uh, parental source, and uh, 
one of the, the key findings for the microbial genomics er error is that uh, uh, there's a lot of horizontal gene transfer occurring between uh, uh, bacterial cells. So here is the, the quick work, uh, sort of high level workflow of whole genome shotgun sequencing. You of course start with the, the culture isolates and if for metagenomic samples, you would bypass the isolation process and go straight to DNA extraction. The DNAs are then uh, fragmented and with the sequencing adapter uh, attached to, the, to each piece, uh, sometimes including the barcodes, the unique barcodes are used to identify uh, individual samples, and that then is um, uh, made into a DNA sequencing library and put on a sequencer. And at the end of the, the process, what you get is a, a huge text file with A, T, C, and Gs um, that you somehow have to make sense of. But after this workshop, you'll be able to do some of the analysis associated with the sequence files. The cost of her mega base of DNA sequencing has dropped uh, exponentially in the in the um, uh, <coughs> past little while, and um, the initial genome cost, uh, human genome cost, a hundred million to sequence, and now it's about ten thousand dollars to sequence a human genome, and correspondingly, because bacterial genomes are a, a hundredth of a of of um, a human genomes in terms of size, theoretically you should be able to sequence a bacterial genome for as little as ten dollars per genome. In reality, we're still at the hundred dollar range, somewhere between a hundred to to five hundred dollars, depending on again how uh, how you batch the samples and how streamlined the process is. And this, of course, also doesn't account for the labor costs include, uh, involved in sequencing. I'll quickly go over the sequence analysis uh, process. Uh, these are things that we're not necessarily covering uh, the, in the, in the um, workshop, but you'll have some hands-on exp uh, experience. Uh, uh, you'll have some opportunity to do some hands-on uh, exercise with, with these. But uh, if you're interested in some of these uh, and not, didn't have any more experience, I'll point you to some of the resources. And, and again, there are resources online that, uh, and, and workshops online too that you can do. Oh, okay. So <laughs> another shameless plug is that there is a workshop that deal with, with this topic. Okay. Okay. So uh, the steps of once the, the DNA are uh, DNA sequence is generated. Um, the steps of data analysis typically include in, include assembly of the of the genome, either through de novo assembly or through a mapping exercise to map the reads back to a reference genome. Uh, and then after that, you can carry out annotation. In other words, adding information, biological uh, information to the sequences. Uh, this process including predicting, you know, where the gene is found on the piece of DNA and what the function of the gene or um, non-coding uh, non regions might be uh, in the um, sequence. And then, uh, as was covered uh, later today, it, uh, is we will also want to identify variants uh, such as single nucleotide polymorphism or elytic um, differences from the sequence data. So for genome assembly, there are broadly two categories of genome assemblers. The task, of course, is to re reconstitute the whole genome from fragments of DNAs that you sequenced. And as you may know, the reason we need to fragment the DNA is that most of the current uh, 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 sequencing platforms generate short reads rather than, than genomic size reads. Um, so the de novo assembly is uh, very much like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You try to uh, identify fragments that overlap each other and, and essentially uh, align them uh, to assemble the reads. Uh, and the reference-based approach is a bit like uh, that 
like the diagram showed here, that you already have a, a reference genome, a reference picture in place, and all you're trying to do is to um, map the most similar reads back to the reference. There are some challenges associated with assembly. Uh, first of all, some of the, uh, well, all of this uh, platforms has certain sequencing errors associated with it. So you, when you're trying to assemble the genomes, you're not necessarily looking at 100% identical overlaps. So you need to allow some error margins for uh, the, uh, in the overlapping regions. And second, there are repetitive regions in the genome, and these could confuse the assemblers. So two distinct but repetitive regions may be collapsed into a single uh, sequence by uh, the assembler, um, and therefore potentially um, uh, remove, for example, if you have two repeats like that, and they get collapsed, and the intervening regions may not be assembled properly, and that intervening region may, may drop out of the assembler. So you potentially lose information when uh, in this assembly. And this, of course, can be important when you're trying to type organisms based on, say, repeats in the genome and, and other uh, genomic features that you're looking at. If the assembly is incorrect, that can result in mistyping of the, uh, of the string. I would assume that obviously this is a problem for genome assembly and like species identification, but also maybe get to this later, but for quantifying the number of reads that you have for a particular organism to determine the like pathogenic load. Are there bioinformatic tools to help you determine it? Because like with, with human genomes, you've got copy number variation, so <coughs> map that and determine the number of copies per genome rather than per organism. But when you have do you know what I mean? Like is there a way to resolve that with determining bacterial load if you've got uh, regions in a genome? So, yes. Yeah, so, for example, um, in metagenomic analysis, people use 16S, but 16S sequence is, uh, there are multiple copies of your, of 16S RNA in the genome, and different uh, organisms have different numbers of 16S. So, to do the analysis properly, you actually have to adjust for the copy number of a given gene uh, in the in the genome, and by and large, we don't see that uh, done. And so, so that's a very very good point. Um, and the other point is, if you're trying to assemble, you're trying to use re repeats as a marker. Uh, for example, tendon repeats as a marker. Uh, these regions are notoriously poorly assembled, so that could also, uh, especially by these short reads, so that could also affect your your interpretation. Any other question? Uh, so this is just a, a list of uh, the sequencing errors on some of the next generation and third generation platforms. Uh, the key point here is the third generation sequencers such as PacBio or, or Oxford Nanopore still have much higher error rates compared to the, uh, the second generation uh, sequencers such as Illumina. And, um, to minimize the, the errors uh, in sequencing, the same region of the genome typically sequenced multiple times. Uh, and typically, people aim for 30x uh, coverage. Uh, and you will see uh, later on in the workshop that the depth coverage is used as a threshold or a cutoff for some of the analysis. And this is basically how many times a, a region has, is sequenced. Um, in your in your sample, and typically the consensus uh, is then taken as a as a correct sequence. So when you have the when when your depth coverage is too low, and there are sequencing errors, you might not be able to properly determine the cons uh, consensus sequence. So after assembly, there's often still gaps in the genome that cannot be closed due to lack of sequencing uh, coverage, or more likely due to unresolved repeats. Uh, so uh, typically 16S, as an example, 
are not properly assembled when when you just do an automated um, whole genome assembly. So instead of a complete genomes, you get a set of contiguous sequences or contexts that represent most of the genome but might miss uh, certain regions. So to close the gaps uh, manually, what is uh, typically called the finishing step of uh, genomic sequencing is labor intensive. Um, t I think it still costs um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, sorry, not hundreds. Uh, tens of thousands of dollars to do this because it involves manually designing uh, PCR primers to try to close the gaps. And this has been alleviated by combining uh, third generation sequencers which have uh, longer reads with, with the short, uh, uh, more high quality reads from second generation sequencers uh, to improve the, the overall sequencing uh, assembly process. Uh, yeah, for some reason, this slide didn't flow properly. <coughs> okay, well, missing some text there, but is it showing up on the? Yes, it, is. it is right. Yeah, but anyway, this is just to say that for genome annotation, um, we're typically looking for the function and locations of the open reading frames with, with the genes. And uh, locating the, uh, the genes is a little bit like um, when you look at a string of characters, um, you can typically pick out words in, the, in those random characters. I'm sure all of you have seen like a puzzle where you get the a, a matrix of, uh, of letters and then you're supposed to find the first word and that's supposed to be telling you something about your life and so the our ability to do that it's it's very similar to computers ability to recognize patterns in um, in in random sequences so genes that are that encodes for proteins at certain frequency profiles are quite different from non-coding regions so using this uh, uh, Different using the difference in, in the uh, coding frequency, um, the computer programs can quite reliably uh, identify coding genes in uh, the DNA sequence. And for microbial genomes, the accuracy is 98% plus. So it's it's really a problem that uh, has been uh, solved by bioinformatics. Uh, while we're able to identify the locations of coding genes, to know the functions of, of the coding genes is a much more uh, difficult problem. And uh, this involves uh, functional annotation of the, of the gene. So this is just a diagram that I think it's from Gary a while back that shows sort of the, the overall workflow of, uh, of an, an automated annotation engine. You uh, start with the contig and you go, you, do, uh, you go through some regional annot uh, annotations to identify non-coding and coding genes, um, non-coding regions and, and uh, coding, uh, protein coding genes. And for each, for each of the uh, coding genes, so you have to uh, carry out functional identifications. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, both, both using automatic I just realized I'm not playing. Both using automatic approaches and also manual uh, inspection by human curators. And also uh, the non-coding regions, there are tools to help predict the RNAs and other um, non-coding sequences. So functional prediction, the most common way to do that is through sequence similarity search. And it's assumed that genes that have sequence similarity are derived from the same ancestral gene and therefore have a sure similar functions. Uh, so that's the, the, the basic tenant of uh, sequence similarity, basic assumption of sequence similarity search. So BLAST is the most common tool for performing this, analys uh, this analysis. So you infer the function of one gene or one protein based on its similarity to a known function. Uh, sorry, to a, to a gene or protein of known function. And this is called transitive annotation. So you, actually, you didn't actually study the function 
of the gene that you sequence, but you infer its function from another um, gene that has been annotated in the database. And this, of course, requires a database uh, such as GenBank or SwissProd and, and so on. So how many of you have done blast search? All of you? Okay, so that's good. I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, so let's skip. Yeah, I think I can skip that. And there's different versions of BLAST that allow you to do uh, nucleotide and protein searches and combination thereof. Uh, briefly, some rule of thumbs regarding interpretation of BLAST results. So uh, as you know, at the end of BLAST search, you get a score and you get an E-value. So how many of you know what E-value means? Anyone? So when you see an E-value, uh, how do you interpret them? It, well, first of all, is a high E value good or a low E value good for if you want to try to find a match? Low E value? Okay. And anyone want to give? Uh, is it the probability of finding the, the match if it, was, if it was random? The probability of finding a match in the Randomly, by chance, random. Yeah, so, well, so here I'll give you an analogy for that. Let's say you have a, a phone book with a lot of names in it, right? So the chance of you finding a, a common last name is going to be a lot higher than finding a non common last name. But not all common last names are related, not all people have the common last name are related to each other, right? So just like some, not all sequences that are similar are related to each other. So there uh, sequences are called low complex regions. Heard of that before? So there are regions of sequence that are low complexity and that could be derived simply by, by chance or simply by, um, by some uh, functional constraints, but they are not actually evolved from the same common ancestor. So when you do a blast search, the, the program takes into account how common a sequence is found in the database and use that information to uh, interpret what's the probability of you identify a similar sequence that's actually not related to the sequence that you, uh, that you, are, that you have. So kind of makes sense. So as I say, using the phone book analogy, it's like you're finding someone who has the same last name as you, but it's actually unrelated to you. The probability of, of, find, of, of that happening would be much higher if, you're common, if, you're, if you have a common last name versus a very uncommon last name. Yeah? And it depends on the size of your phone book. And it depends on the size of your phone book or your database. Does anyone want to offer a different interpretation or explanation of E value? No? Good. Okay. Okay, sure. That would be great. So that's a more uh, technical description of how the statistical values are actually derived. Okay. So hopefully that gives you some intuitive sense of when you see the E value, um, you all know that it, it, it approaches zero. That means the probability of finding a sequence, an unrelated sequence by that's similar to your sequence by chance it's, it's approaching zero. And if you, if the higher the number, that means the prob, the, the, not the probability, but actually the, the number of times you see the sequences by chance, it, it is higher. Okay. 
so the rule of thumb is that uh, for a typical glass alignment, E value scores should be at least smaller than 0.01, and often we use point, uh, 10 to the minus 5 as a, as a safe cutoff. Uh, and this is, uh, sorry, this is referring to protein uh, sequence alignment. So for DNA, we typically do use a much lower uh, E value cutoff. Uh, e value and scores are related, but the but E value contains more information. Because, uh, because uh, as Rob described, it's based on uh, randomized data sets and, and uh, the uh, statistical probability uh, framework. Uh, the percent identity, again, is more intuitive. Um, it refers to essentially how similar the two sequences are to each other when you, when you line them up. So 100% identity means the two sequences are the same. 99% that means one base out of the, well, one amino acid out of the 100 base or amino acid are different. Okay. Uh, this is just a list of uh, automated annotation systems that you can actually try it out on, on your own. So once you have a, a genome process, you can do so for many genomes and, and then compare them to each other. The goal of comparative genomic is to identify genomic variations that, being, that can correlate to phenotypical characteristics. So again, this is a genotype to phenotype mapping that we're trying to achieve through comparing genomes. Uh, so for example, we might be interested to know why certain isolates, pathogens, are, ma um, are more resistant to a certain antibiotics than others. So you might want to compare the two genomes and see if you can identify resistant genes and so on. And we can also use uh, the variations to track transmissions of pathogens, as you'll see in, in the workshop. So roughly speaking, comparative genomics can be done at three levels. One is the regional differences. If there's recombination or rearrangement, uh, you can detect it through comparative genomics. Uh, there's uh, the gene level um, analysis that will be covered by uh, Ed in, the, in his uh, session. Uh, these involved, but, but also in this case, uh, you can be, you can uh, do a gene profile comparison, in other words, comparing the presence or absence of genes. Uh, so uh, the last one is a um, nucleotide level, uh, level comparison. And one example is the single nucleotide variants or small indels uh, that can be used to, to compare microbial genomes and therefore used to type them. And this will be covered in um, the, in our next session. So the first genome, as I mentioned, was published in 95, and soon after that, the first comparative genomic came out, and they just compared the minimum number that they need in order to call it a comparative genomics paper. So two helical pylori genomes were compared. Uh, they were isolated seven years apart. And what's very interesting, and, and um, at least at that time, was that they were able to line up the two genomes, as you can see here, and then they saw that the strain-specific genes are actually quite um, uh, quite well clustered uh, to each other. And so through these type of analysis, the idea of genomic islands uh, was introduced, where uh, it's believed that essentially a large cassette of DNA was uh, were acquired uh, by one strain uh, versus, or oh, and the, the the other strain acquired a different cassette. So, um, and this allows us to actually identify regions that are horizontally acquired uh, by essentially line up two genomes and compare regions that are that are different, and that in combination with other uh, DNA-based signals. Uh, called uh, genomic signatures, uh, uh, how um, horizontally acquired genes are um, identified. So 
uh, if you're interested in this area, uh, Rob is an expert in in the in this uh, type of analysis, and so is Fiona Brinkman. So you can talk to them more about it later on today. Okay, so now moving to more than two genomes, um, you can compare um, large number of genomes from the same species of organism, and uh, this is called the, the species pen genome. The, the term was first coined in 2005 by uh, Hervé Tatlin and others at the uh, uh, TIGER, uh, the Institute for Genomic Research at the time in which they compared sequent uh, genomes from six different uh, strap agalatia. Um, and what they were able to do is they were able to identify the genes that are shared by all, all these isolates, and they coined the term uh, core genes to, um, for, for the shared genes. And they also uh, found that these genes typically are housekeeping genes. And there are, on the other hand, these accessory genes, which are the strain-specific uh, regions or gene uh, in the different uh, isolates. So the pen genome is calculated by extrapolating the observed, observe uh, extrapolates the observations based on the limit number of strains that you're able to sequence, and then to come up with a theoretical limit <laughs> on the genome uh, size for the entire species. So uh, in that lecture, lecture and, and tutorial, you also learn more about pen, pen genomes. And what they, when they did that, they found, out, found that some species have what's called open pen genomes. In other words, uh, no matter how many number of genomes they sequence and add to the analysis, the, the line, um, which is the uh, number of, the y-axis is the number of new genes discovered. Uh, so in, with increased number of genome sequence, it never appre uh, approach um, zero. So this is to be expected if the organisms are undergoing horizontal gene transfer or uh, and, and acquire genes uh, from non-parental sources. Uh, some other more strict uh, human, uh, some other uh, pathogens, on the other hand, uh, have what's called closed pen genome. In other words. Uh, you, as you sequence more genomes, eventually no gene, uh, theoretically no new genes were discovered. It, there's actually no true closed pen genomes because organisms typically do have some capacity to acquire new genes. But this type of analysis helped microbiologists to predict how the species will evolve over time and how many genomes need to be sequenced in order to characterize a species. And in Ed's lecture, again, we'll talk a bit more about popu uh, population genomics of, of pathogens. Um, so you extend on this, this, uh, this concept. All right, so I'm going to switch gear and talk about the, the challenges in data integration and sharing, and specifically focus on what's called ontology. Uh, before I do that, any question regarding to sequence analysis or any comments? Okay. Um, okay, so as you know, and how many of you actually work in, in government or public health sector lab and not an uh, uh, academic lab? So yeah, okay, so, so you know there you have, in your day-to-day -day activity, you typically need to interact with other groups. If you're a national lab, you need to interact with the regional and local labs if you, and vice versa. And uh, that's true for both epidemiology but also for laboratory um, um, activities. The, so there are many different players in this uh, complex ecosystem, and the most common way uh, to talk to each other now is still by over the phone or by fax. So we, for example, still get fax from National Microbiology Lab with test results. Right then. The challenge with that is that someone has then to type to take a piece of paper, then enter it, enter it into our own system. Um, 
and vice versa. We also send them paper-based form that they have to enter manually. So, um, and on top of this uh, labor-intensive uh, recoding yeah. exercise, we also have the, the phenomenon that information are collected at the, the local or the frontline labs, um, and as they get passed on to more specialized labs, less and less information get passed on, um, sometimes by choice because of privacy concerns, but a lot of times simply because the, it's, it's labor intensive to pass on information and, and to, to, to recode that information into a new system. And the, the dilemma is that the amount of bioinformatic and analytical expertise is typically concentrated at, centr at the um, reference labs with the, with the, uh, the national um, um, public health agencies and typically a lot less uh, available at the frontline labs and so on. So how can we improve data sharing uh, integration to to address these dilemmas. Here's a funny gift that I found about uh, well, it's modern <laughs> software development, but because there are many different systems in public health labs uh, and, and public health agencies, it, it's actually quite keen to what we're trying to do here <laughs> as well. So the part of the issue associated with this, and I have to thank Damien for some of the slides uh, uh, that I'm, I'm presenting here. So um, some of the, um, sorry, the contextual information are often uh, institutional specific. So examples including there are different acronyms or code used for the same antibiotics. So when you convert from one system to the next, some people have to recode that information. Um, the other example is there's different terminology used to describe the same concept or concepts with subtle differences. So, for example, in the um, risk factor forms for a BCCDC, we use alcoholism to describe someone who had a problem with alcohol consumption uh, as a risk factor to infectious diseases, in, in this case, uh, tuberculosis. But in public health England, they would call it substantial alcohol use or abuse. Another example is that we would say a patient died versus uh, that uh, it's, uh, the, the word that PHE use would be death rather than die, died. So these subtle differences are okay for human interpretation, but when it comes to trying to build a computational system to allow data integration and interoperability, these minor differences uh, becomes the stumbling block. And there's other examples like the use of, of different units to measure uh, the same uh, uh, same test or more challenging is that you, you can have different tests trying to address this, the similar question. So for example, using uh, different platforms for um, and antibiogram could actually result in incom incompatible data. Um, and this is something that Andrew, I think, will talk about, about uh, in his lecture, uh, how using ontology to, uh, uh, to encode for antibiotic-resistant genes and mechanism. And lastly, uh, here's an example that Damien found. There's different severe severity gradients used in the UK hospital system versus American system. So in uh, America, there's only five different gradients from bad to, to good, whereas UK, it's more refined. So they have disease, which is the same as, as dead, of course. But then there's critical, but stable, or stable, which 
you have to somehow slot it into a gradient to make the two lists <coughs> comparable. And these are challenges that um, uh, data integration uh, faces. So the metadata problems uh, include spelling uh, inconsistencies, synonyms used at different uh, institutes, and also semantic uh, level issues. Uh, as an example here, diarrhea, which is uh, defined as a normal increase of frequent uh, increased frequency of loose or watery bowel movement, have here's the list of word cloud that describe essentially diarrhea. So you have loose stool, feces, flow out, so on and so forth. So all these terms describe the same concept. Uh, and you have a related concept, fecal, uh, which is portion of semi-solid body waste discharged through the anus. Sorry for the um, explicit description there. But uh, the point is that these two terms are um, related to each other, yet they really don't share any uh, words or definitions. As Damien saliently point out, the only word that's shared is uh, between the two definitions is off. So if you're just looking at the two terms as a uh, by using a computer, there's no um, way that for a computer to know that these highly related terms are indeed semantically uh, related uh, to each other. So uh, a few years ago, we embarked on an exercise of trying to use ontology to describe genomic epidemiology. And uh, first, uh, let's define ontology. So it's a mechanism to specify and to express a body of knowledge. So um, these uh, include the use of st standardized and well-defined hier uh, hierarchy of terms. And each term also have a unique universal ID associated with it. So you have an ID that's associated with a concept and therefore allow you to use different terms to describe the same thing. Whereas, uh, how many of you have worked on data dictionaries before? Yeah. So in a data dictionary, often you define the, the terms directly and therefore when you move to a different data dictionary, you have to do a mapping between the words rather than in this case we can map at the uh, using a universal ID across different systems. And the terms uh, are also interconnect with logical relationships. So in this example of diarrhea and fecal, then someone will, will have to give it a logical relationship uh, describing how the terms are related to each other. So the uh, ontology is an inherently um, coherent tools can act as a universal adapter, as I've shown here, as an analogy to uh, facilitate data uh, interchange. And more importantly, it's in the both human and computer readable format. So uh, Bobo Foundry is a collection of, of ontologies, and it started off with uh, gene, gene ontology um, as the, the initial system, but since then has expanded to over 100 different <coughs> domain ontologies describing different uh, domains of knowledge. And also equally important is that it's an open source um, project that allows people to reuse and recycle the terms uh, as much as possible. So in matter of fact, they, they encourage you to reuse the resources rather than to reinvent the wheels. So back to the, the example we had before, uh, diarrhea, which is mapped to a concept in the human phenotype ontology, uh, and uh, fecal, which is mapped to a human anatomic ontology called Uberon. Well, not, not just humans. So, uh, Organismal, uh, um, uh, organismal um, uh, ontology is, is uh, that can now be then connected uh, through the use of uh, shared framework. So genomic epidemiology ontology or GenEpio is a project we started a while back. 
and it's an attempt to bring together different uh, domains of genomic epidemiology, including lab analytics, uh, sample metadata, epidemiological investigations, uh, clinical data, and reporting under the same uh, ontological framework to allow data to be uh, harmonized. So I need to load this. And so uh, this involves mapping out the different, uh, sorry, some of them is hard to read, but it involves mapping out the different concepts of different uh, terms in the, in the workflow and then uh, describing the relationship of these terms. So we have um, made the, the resource publicly available, and there are currently over 700 specific terms, but over 2,000 terms in total that are uh, captured a variety of uh, domain uh, vocabularies that I briefly described. So the idea is that we hopefully will have a plug and play feature where uh, you can extrapolate from geographic information to uh, uh, population health related information all uh, encoded <laughs> in a coherent um, knowledge framework. Of course, it's a, we're a long way from that, but we're, we're making inroad towards that. And in the future, we can also encode mathematical formulas and other uh, SOP, uh, standard operating protocols, and so on, as, as using ontology and therefore improve the interoperability of laboratory processes and epidemiological um, calculations uh, and so on. And we have a website and a, and a, um, a consortium set up that we definitely encourage people working in, in public health to, to join us and to help us build up these resources that you can in turn use for your own um, institution. Okay, so very briefly, uh, I mentioned module two and three will be today. We explored uh, the variations in microbial genomes, phylogenetic reconstruction, outbreak investigation, pathogen tracing, source attribution, and so on. And it will be um, uh, the first in, with the introduction of phylogenetic analysis that Gary would do, to, which is important. It's an important basis for many of the downstream analysis. So just want to make sure you understand how to interpret a phylogenetic tree. Uh, tomorrow on module four, uh, Andrew will talk about antimicrobial resistant gene detection and analysis using whole genome sequence data. Uh, with WHO just in February released some high priority pathogens uh, for R&D of new antibiotics. Uh, this is a very hot area and, and certainly topical to uh, um, to public health. In, uh, in Module 5, Rob will talk about phylogenetic phylogeography. So this is a, I'm sure most of you know the story of uh, John Snow and, uh, and the uh, cholera outbreak in London. Um, those, this is a map of it. But of course, this is this has uh, geographic information only. So in Rob's lecture, he would show some of the visualization and some of the analysis of how you can combine geographic information with uh, genomic sequence or phylogenetic uh, data. Okay, in module six, we'll be talking about uh, in cases where you don't know what. Um, pathogen is, is, is uh, implicated in an outbreak, how do you detect potential pathogens using metagenomic sequencing? Um, and also some of the rapidly involved pathogens such as viruses may actually change um, to the point that uh, your, the PCR primers you design to try to detect it is, will no longer be be able to detect it, and in those cases, again, maybe metagenomics is the only solution you have. So, some pictures of Ebola and, and Zika outbreaks and um, stories associated with that. Okay, module seven by Anne, uh, sorry, by Anna is uh, on 
uh, data visualization. So with increasing large and heterogeneous data sets, how can we use data visualizations techniques to help us understand and interpret the data? Um, here I'm just showing some of the some of the visualization techniques I use for visualizing genomes <coughs> or and genomic islands. Uh, Genghis, which Rob will talk about, is for phylogeographic analysis. And the goal is really that we should be able to uh, synthesize different data types and to go to describe the, the phenomena. So in this case, the wind pattern in the U.S. is 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 being synthesized and described in this single um, animation. If you go to the website, we'll show show the animation. Okay, so that's all for the background intro section. Any questions? No. Great. Thank you.